Now, where are we with the new Indian variant? I want to just go through a lot of the data, but before we get to some of the charts, and some of them do look a little bit scary, it's worth just bearing this in mind. You know, this is the context uh, to bear in mind for when you, when you hear anything about variants uh, of concern. It's the fact, and this just shows you the COVID infection rate uh, in England, similar story in Scotland, uh, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. And right now, we are at the lowest rate that we've been uh, in terms of percentage uh, since early September. So the news is really promising. It's come down to very low levels. And bear in mind the fact that any of the charts I'm going to show you showing kind of a rise in variants, they're happening within this really tiny area, uh, basically, where um, cases are very low indeed. That being said, uh, this variant is on the rise. And it's worth just kind of focusing on what we're talking about when we say on the rise. Well, this shows you um, what the Nigerian variant, the Brazilian variant, I don't have the South African variant there, but it's more or less the same picture, really very low uh, indeed in terms of its kind of prevalence. And this is just showing you number of cases per week, uh, Public Health England uh, data. Now let's add on um, the Indian variants. And you can probably see there's a big difference, isn't it? So this is different, substantially different to every other variant of this, of COVID-19 that we've seen uh, in the UK thus far except, of course, for the Kent variant. You'll remember the Kent variant, which implanted it kind of became the main variant uh, in the UK around the kind of winter time. Well, if you look at that and add that on, actually, I've got to kind of, you know, expand the, the size of this and squeeze down the axis. Um, you can see that that's completely dominant and the Indian variant looks like it's a relatively small slice. But it's rising quickly. So much, actually, so much so that Chris Whitty thinks that it could become the dominant strain uh, in the UK. Why is that? Well, it's worth just looking uh, at the rate at which it's growing. And what we can do here is compare the different growth rates of various uh, of these different variants. So what we've got here is these lines are basically, they start at the moment that cases surpassed 10. So you're kind of talking about a relatively gradual increase for South Africa. You're talking about something that looks... Pretty similar for one of those Brazilian strains, P2, a lot of talk about that strain. But now consider what's going on uh, with this Indian variant. You saw it before, it's a slightly different story, different growth rate, substantially different. The question, of course, is whether this line looks any different to what we saw from the Kent variant at the start of the Kent variant. Because we're, we're basically kind of aligning these to the moment that, that variant, those variants were first detected. Well, let's add on that Kent variant it's a pretty similar line for the most part, slightly under where it is, but that looks like a not dissimilar growth rate. OK, and, and again, what we've done here uh, is uh, we've got an axis that isn't kind of big enough to fit this on. But if you kind of look at where Kent headed, well, who knows, if the Indian variant continues with its current growth rate, then you're potentially going to see it doing that. But of course, that depends on a lot of other things as well. It depends how much COVID there is around. It depends how much uh, susceptibility there is. And of course, it depends on the vaccination programme as well. By the way, you'll probably remember when we're looking at lines like this, it's worth just looking at them on a um, logarithmic chart. And if we do it that way, here's how it looks. This is the logarithmic scale. It's kind of, it's better at reflecting growth rates. And again, what you can see is the Indian variant is not dissimilar in terms of growth rate uh, to that Kent variant. So that's why Chris Whitty's talking about it potentially uh, overtaking it, becoming the dominant variant. And it could well be that it's more, uh, it's more transmissible. We just don't really know how, tra how transmissible it is. And that really is something that hopefully we'll know a bit more about in the coming weeks, but it's so early uh, right now. When I say early though, there is a question here, which is, should the government have intervened earlier to put India on the red list and prevent some of these cases from coming in. Because what we're talking about with this is, for the most part, imported cases. This line here is the same thing. It's the Indian variant, basically, the total of, of this particular variant of concern, B1.617.2 for what it's worth. Uh, and what you can see are domestic cases, but then you've got imported cases, travellers bringing it into the country. And what you can probably make out is the white bit starts first and then you can see it transferring through to domestic cases. So first it's people bringing it into the country on flights from Mumbai, from Delhi and so on, and then bringing it in and then you start to see it seeding domestic cases. And let's not forget there was a moment, wasn't there, around early April 
when a lot of people were looking at what was going on in India and indeed the Indian subcontinent and thinking, do we maybe need restrictions here? Uh, and in early April, on the 2nd of April, the government implemented restrictions uh, on Pakistan and Bangladesh. So they got added to the red list, hotel quarantines, things like that. Um, but it took all the way until the 19th of April for India to be added to that list. And actually, it wasn't until the 23rd of April that that was implemented. So you had a long period here. Uh, then you had the warning. Then you had an extra kind of three and a half days where people had a chance to change their plans and potentially fly to the UK. And a lot of that, frankly, a lot of that happened. You can see it here. You can see that white bit there, the rise, that's, that's essentially this variant getting a foothold. And then you can see it transferring through to the domestic cases as well. We don't really know what happens next, but Boris Johnson's saying, making it clear, look, when we were looking at this, when we were deciding which countries were going to go on the red list, it was about variants, and it turned out that Pakistan, Bangladesh had a lot of the South Africa variants, so it was about variants. But here's the thing. That's not the only thing that SAGE and these other committees uh, look at when they're just making these decisions. They also look at case numbers. And so what would be, you know, what's the things look like if you look specifically at case numbers in these countries? Well, same thing again. These are just overall case numbers. It's not about the variant, OK? And this shows you case numbers in Pakistan and in Bangladesh, and you can see the UK uh, there as well. And that was the 2nd of April when uh, they were added to the red list. So the question, of course, is where was India at that stage? Let's add on the Indian line. Well, it had far more cases, even back then, uh, than Pakistan and Bangladesh. And you saw what happened next. I mean, it took, obviously, until the 19th of April for the government to add India to the red list. By that stage, India was kind of a day or so from having the biggest outbreak of COVID-19 ever. So bigger than anything we saw in the US, for instance, last year, uh, the biggest in pure number terms. So a lot of people would look at that, would look at the last slide as well, and just ask themselves, well, could this have happened earlier? And frankly, we don't really know the full rationale as to why these decisions were taken. Why was it that India was added to the list very late? But it's just worth bearing in mind. Up until the day that that announcement happened with India added to the red list, the government was planning to do a trade mission uh, to India. That was very seen as very important for its economic policy. So some people wonder whether that might have been part of the explanation for why it was left so late. Um, but we just it, we don't really know at the moment, frankly. Um, however, and this is a really important thing to bear in mind, alongside all of the other kind of caveats that I've made. You know, what we've seen so far from the data is quite promising when it comes to suggesting the vaccines uh, are working on this. We're just going to zoom in very quickly. I've, I've shown this chart once before, but I think it's worth just reiterating it. Zoom into Bolton where you're seeing the most cases. And like I say, like that first chart showed you, it's still small amounts in the grand scheme of things. 47 in the past uh, fortnight or so in Bolton. But now have a look at what you're seeing in terms of the rise in actual cases there. And there's a pretty striking story there. Look at this. Under 60s, you are seeing a big increase uh, in cases, looking almost exponential, that curve there. But now look at over 60s, and you see something else. For over 60s, you're not really seeing much of a rise at all. And given those are people who have been mostly vaccinated, that's pretty encouraging. So, you know, right now, we don't know for sure just how efficacious the vaccines are against this variant. But early news and early data is pretty promising. We need to keep an eye on this stuff uh, in the coming weeks. As we do on stuff like this, this chart, I know it's not especially kind of visually uh, palatable, but this is a chart from Warwick presented to Sage. And the idea behind it was basically to say, look, if this is more transmissible, you're going to start to see more hospitalizations. So the highest line there makes the assumption, even if vaccines work, uh, that it's 50% more transmissible, and that results in a peak in hospitalizations that's even higher than the second wave. But of course, you know, we've seen charts like this before, haven't we? You probably remember them. And a lot of the focus every time is on those high lines. That's just unfortunately the, the way it happens. But that's not always a given that it, it'll actually happen that way. This, do you remember this one? This is an imperial chart from the time when the easing of lockdown was kind of announced. And the warning was that it was very possible we we're going to see a resurgence in cases in the coming months. But here's what actually happened. Have a look at those dots, the ones on the far left. Here's what actually happened, because we have the data through. Look at that. Far from going up in line with those kind of, you know, scary lines that a lot of people actually focused on, a lot of people reported at the time, you know, hospitalizations rising really fast, actually, what actually happened to hospitalizations so far was maybe even lower than the best case scenario. 
So just bear that in mind when you're seeing scary charts and scary prognostications uh, from epidemiologists. Nonetheless, a lot to keep an eye on in the coming weeks. Uh, so far, the Indian variant does seem to be growing fast. So far, it does look as exponential, maybe even more so than the Kent variant. But whether we're t facing those consequences of higher hospitalizations, well, it's way too early to know. And there's some encouraging evidence, uh, but also let's just wait and see what the data tells us.